The following program is a PBS Wisconsin original production. You're watching Here and Now 2024 election coverage. This just in, we can now call the... Political ads are using artificial intelligence to push their agenda, but the political playbook is still the same. I'm Frederica Freiberg. Tonight on Here and Now, election season means a battle over the airwaves in political ads, which now include artificial intelligence. And as the political climate has become so embattled, social studies teachers are being pressured not to teach about the electoral system. Then, surge at the southern border has led to a crackdown on asylum seekers. We follow one man's journey from Cameroon to Wisconsin. And deaths from overdose finally appear to be abating. We look at how local communities are addressing the problem head on. It's Here and Now for September 27. Funding for Here and Now is provided by the Focus Fund for Journalism and Friends of PBS Wisconsin. Political groups are expected to spend $423 million on campaign ads in Wisconsin this year, with $60 million in ads for the presidential race alone, reserved for airtime between now and Election Day. We may be used to attack ads stretching the truth or twisting facts, but a new concern comes with the growing use of artificial intelligence, or AI, to create an entirely new false reality. Here are now senior political reporters. Reporter Zach Schultz has the story. Watch just about any local newscast in Wisconsin, and when the station cuts to break, many of the commercials will be campaign ads. Thanks a lot, Kamala. Political will occupy a large percentage of our available inventory between now and, and the election, and have for many months. Steve Lavin is the general manager of WBAY TV in Green Bay. In a purple state, campaign ads are the best way to reach the last few voters who haven't already made up their minds. Well, let's be honest, but the majority of the public has already decided the way that they're going to vote, and these ads are just over that little fringe 5 to 7 percent of undecideds, really undecideds in the middle. Most of the controversies over campaign ads come when one side demands their opponent retract an ad due to inaccuracies or technicalities. Lavin says TV stations have lawyers to deal with those issues. I'll never pull an ad myself because, um, number one, I would rather the other side, if there's falsehoods in an ad, the other side has every bit of right to actually answer those by buying more ads, right? A new concern over ads has to do with the growing use of artificial intelligence, or AI, to generate images that look real. Earlier this year, the legislature passed a bill that requires any campaign ad using AI to include that information. Anytime they're using any type of AI, they're supposed to disclose it. Not disclosing comes with a $1,000 penalty. But that penalty would be paid by the group running the ad. An amendment to the bill made sure broadcasters are not liable if AI is used and not disclosed. There is a bit of responsibility on the side of the broadcasters, but it's also extremely hard to police. How Mike Wagner is a professor of journalism at the University of Wisconsin who has studied the use of AI in political speech. How can they know for sure the video was AI generated? How can they know for sure the script was AI generated? Lavin says so far there's no evidence of any AI in campaign ads. Since that law went into place, I have not seen or heard an ad that has used that disclaimer yet. So either it's, if it's being used, nobody's disclosing it, or they've determined that, that the penalties are so high that they're just not going to use AI to determine it. I think the real danger with AI in this election is not in campaign advertisements, it's in social media posts that go viral. We've already seen examples of this. Using AI as a boogeyman, so something happens and the other side says, oh, that must be AI, it can't possibly be real. In August, Kamala Harris held a rally at an airport hangar in Detroit, Michigan. Donald Trump falsely claimed photos of the event used AI to make the crowd look bigger. I spoke at that rally. I spoke to all 15,000 of those people. They are real. Garland Gilchrist is Michigan's lieutenant governor. Donald Trump was so insecure about that crowd that he had to find a way to try to delegitimize it. 
And so by playing on the fears of people and saying it was artificial intelligence to think, that's all he knows how to do is play on people's fears. Wagner says beyond making AI a boogeyman, there's another way AI can be abused. The other is that a candidate picks up on a, a post that uses AI and treats it as true, which has also happened, where a former President Trump shared information that Taylor Swift had endorsed him, which she had not. Neither AI incident seems to have affected the race for president. Taylor Swift later endorsed Kamala Harris, when we fight, we win. who has proven her large crowds are real. What a crowd. You know, Donald Trump says Democrats can only have large crowds because of AI. AI wasn't even involved in the biggest lie of the campaign so far. They're eating the dogs. When Donald Trump falsely claimed Haitian immigrants were stealing pets and eating them in Springfield, Ohio, the source of the misinformation was a Facebook post. No AI involved at all. So when, when these kinds of things happen too, especially when the candidates themselves pick it up and share it, those things are going to take on a life of their own in uh, really remarkable and fast ways that are hard to regulate. The targets for misinformation are the same as the audience for campaign ads. Low information voters who are paying attention at the last minute are often susceptible to, to messages because they're new to them. They haven't been paying attention to the race and these things are new. And the solution to misinformation, whether AI generated or not, is the same as it's always been. There is so much disinformation out there, whether it's in social media, it could be in these campaigns could be spread, spreading disinformation. I think it's up to the individual voter to determine what's actually the truth. Reporting from Green Bay, I'm Zach Schultz for Here and Now. Despite a Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling in July that says absentee drop boxes are fully legal, they still remain a point of contention. Since then, some local clerks around the state have decided they will not allow their residents to use an absentee ballot drop box for the November election, saying they are not secure. But one city mayor took matters into his own hands this week. Donning a hard hat and workers' gloves, Wausau Mayor Doug Dinney wheeled the city's only drop box away from its position outside City Hall, but not before posing for pictures to, quote, memorialize the event. Denny now faces a legal investigation as he is not an election official and this was not a decision approved by anyone but himself. He maintains he did not break the law. As campaigning toward Election Day reaches a fever pitch and most of the world is talking about it, in nearly half of Wisconsin schools, teachers are being restricted from discussing U.S. elections. The Wisconsin Council for the Social Studies is pushing back. Its president and Shorewood Middle School Social Studies teacher and 2023 Teacher of the Year, Sarah Coplin, is here. And thanks very much for being here. Thank you for having me. So your council conducted a survey of teachers on this. Uh, what did that survey find? So we have a monthly newsletter that we send to our membership. And uh, full disclosure, we don't have every teacher in the state of Wisconsin who does teach social study as members of our organization currently. We are working to change that, though. Uh, but 42 percent of the respondents um, in our membership who filled out the survey so that they've experienced uh, scenarios where their district administration, so either their principal uh, or perhaps even their school board has placed limitations upon them for uh, teaching of current events or the election in this upcoming school year. Uh, also, I was recently at the uh, Teaching About Elections conference at UW-Madison and uh, a reporter asked the crowd of educators if they had experienced such uh, things in their districts and every hand in the crowd went up. There was well over 100 educators there. So this is something that we see as an organization. Um, we also asked a similar question at our conference last March uh, and received that type of overwhelming response. So what, what is behind the restrictions and complaints on the part of parents say? So the things that we hear from educators around our state in terms of parent complaints our, te our teachers are conducting uh, units of study where students are learning about how elections work, um, you know, how votes are cast and counted, uh, how the electoral, uh, electoral college process works. And parents are 
hearing from their students that when they come home that this type of topic is being discussed and then immediately complain to principals or school board members that their children are being indoctrinated with political ideology. So that's something we've heard a lot of. And this is not a scenario where an educator is talking about their uh, partisan politics. It's just simply giving students opportunities in classrooms to learn about how our democratic system works. Uh, we also have heard from educators that have had uh, administrators that will just say to them, we don't want you having any discussions in your classrooms about the election at all or any classroom discussions about current events. It's too controversial. We don't want parent complaints, uh, which makes it very difficult for social studies educators when this is related to our state standards and also partially related to some of the statutory requirements that we have in Wisconsin to teach social studies. So are teachers pushing a political agenda in any case in classrooms? So I have yet to come across an educator that tells their students what their political agenda is. Um, you know, as an educator, you are bound by policies in your school district uh, where most districts have similar policies that they purchase uh, from a uh, policy writing consortium. And it basically says that as an educator, you should not give any partisan political viewpoints in your classroom. But simply talking about politics, how politics work, or what issues are taking place in our political sphere is enough in the current um, political atmosphere to make parents and administrators feel like something wrong or nefarious is going on in the classroom. The term of indoctrination is thrown around quite frequently. I have yet to find an educator, though, that is telling any of their students their political ideology. Are these restrictions happening in your own district? They're not happening in my district. Uh, I feel pretty fortunate to teach in a district where not only the community, but our school board and our district administrators at the building levels have been very supportive of social studies education. They have been supportive of us meeting our state standards, which require to student, students to engage in their own inquiry and also to engage in developing civil discourse skills. So um, learning about current events and having current events discussions, learning about the election is something that is valued in the school district that I work in. And in your mind, uh, why is it important for students to learn about government and elections? Well, I our state legislature believes that it is. There's a statute that actually talks about how important that is and it requires that to happen. Um, the school board should provide um, an educational plan for that to take place in school districts. Uh, it's also part of our state standards. But more importantly, I think it's really important for the future of our democracy that our students understand how our government works. Uh, you know, what are the parts of our government? What are their powers and limitations? What are the rights and responsibilities that citizens have in this country? And um, with that being said, how as a person who's part of your community, um, or if you are a citizen as well, how do you engage uh, to ensure that you are making a positive impact on your neighbors? And how can you have a voice to be somebody who is civically engaged? One of our state standards says that Wisconsin stu students will learn how to be civically engaged. And that's really important because we want our future generations to be able to be strong leaders, strong problem solvers, and people that will strengthen and improve the democracy and the country that we have that we have here. We leave it there, Sarah Coplin. Thanks very much. Thank you. Turning to the southern border, a temporary solution to deter a surge of illegal crossings at the U.S.-Mexico border may become more permanent. As Republicans have made immigration a central issue in the presidential election, political pressure has mounted for Democrats to address the issue. An executive order issued in June from President Joe Biden severely limited the number of people who can seek asylum at the border. Immigration advocates fear the policy deters people with legitimate asylum cases who are fleeing their home country for fear of persecution. Here and now, student journalist Jane McCauley follows the journey of one such man who risked it all. At this point, I, I was thinking maybe I make a wrong decision of coming here. Gua Augustine had two choices. He could either face arrest seeking asylum at the U.S. southern border or face political violence in his home country of Cameroon. They look at us like second-class citizens in your own countries. 
Simply because of what? Because you can't speak French, whatever. Cameroon is now in the midst of a violent civil war known as the Anglophone Crisis. Thousands of people have been killed and hundreds of thousands displaced. I said, look, we cannot be in our own country and be treated as a second class citizens. They go on the street, they say, okay, they start protesting, you know, we want our right to be restored. The country's internal conflict is a remnant of French and British colonization. It's been decades of discriminatory policies from the French-speaking government against the country's English-speaking regions. More and more, people like Gua have stood up against the government, risking arrest and torture. Gua's wife and daughter assumed he had died in detention. What they didn't know is that he escaped from Nigeria and fled to South America, starting in Ecuador and traveling north through the Darien Gap, one of the most dangerous places in the world. Over thousands of miles and through eight countries, he reached Mexico. I look like I'm a kind of different human being that come from separate different world, you know. <laughs> I was, and there was a lot of police discrimination. I said, oh, this is simply what I'm running away from. Gua's journey was harrowing, taking a toll both physically and emotionally. I, and I've not talked to my family for all the time I was traveling at that time. And, you know, the, the stress and the emotion was going on. Finally, he arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border. You will not understand what I've been through to get to cross this very border. He's, 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 it was really, when I think of what I've been through to get to this point, it was, I can't even, I can't even find the right word to describe it. When I got into U.S. immigration, I thought, I am safe. I felt relieved. That relief, however, turned to regret as he questioned if leaving for the U.S. was the right decision. When they took me to the, to the detention, I said, I didn't commit any crime. Why are they, like, taking me to this place? He thought seeking asylum meant being protected in the custody of the United States. Instead, he was arrested like a criminal. I, I have never been to prison. I've never committed any crime in my life, apart from being, pro apart from being protested in my home country. And they told him nothing. I thought I was still in Chicago because I didn't even know where I was. It was weeks later he found out he was in a federal detention facility in Dodge County, Wisconsin. This is a humanitarian issue. And Aaron Barbado is director of the UW Law School Immigrant Justice Clinic. Gua says everything changed when he met her. They're risking their lives because they have no other choice. We have laws that allow people to seek protection here when they will be persecuted or have been persecuted in their home country. Seeking asylum is one issue, but proving your case is another. His witness accounts attest to the chaos in his country. He also wears scars on his body that we were able to um, demonstrate were linked to the persecution that he suffered from the government. Obviously, our backgrounds are really different. Tony and Mark Swanby met Gua through Barbado but we had so much in common, like values and belief systems and all that. Guo went to live with them after leaving Dodge County Jail on parole. They became his American parents, giving him a place to call home. Having Guo in our life now has been a real blessing to us. You know, we've inherited another family, if you will, or found, found more family. I like to... I know that you love to listen to stories. After four long years, Gua's wife Stella and then five-year-old daughter Anne received their documents to come to the U.S. I was just like, is this for real? Am I here? I was in shock when I saw him. I was so happy. To, to make a life here in the U.S. And what, what they've been through and what they're going through is just a hard thing. In June, Gua graduated from UW La Crosse with a master's in healthcare administration. After years of hardship, Guo received his asylum in 2021. Now, he's applying for U.S. citizenship. Stella and Anne await their green cards. In the meantime, it means everything to Guo to start a new life in Wisconsin. It's a beautiful thing for your family to be united. I think we're really happy, and I, I'm looking forward to more amazing things. For Here and Now, I'm Jane McCauley. Reporting from Madison.
In health news, good news. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports a more than 10 percent decline in drug deaths this year for the first time after decades of steep increases. Wisconsin mirrors the downward trend. There certainly has been an all-out push to save lives from law enforcement interdiction efforts to harm reduction efforts like Narcan. On the ground locally, the Medical College of Wisconsin also helps communities conduct overdose fatality reviews to look holistically at the victims to help others stay alive until they can get treatment. La Crosse County has been conducting such reviews since 2018. Paula Silov is from the County Health Department. She joins us now. And Paula, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have this discussion. So has La Crosse County also seen a reduction in overdose deaths, as, as has been the case nationally and statewide? Well, our rate in uh, 2023 was the highest that it's ever been. So the, you know, that was end of 2023. When we're looking at 2024, we're behind the numbers that we saw last year at this time. So we're hopeful that the total numbers will be less than you know, 2023, but we don't know that yet. We've still got a few months of 24 to get through. When you're conducting an overdose fatality review, what are you looking at in that person's life? I think we're looking at early substance use. We're also looking at trauma that they may have experienced. You know, were they um, a party to a home where other substance use was going on? Did they have um, particularly difficult schooling? Um, did they move a lot? You know, did, were they a part of a broken family? Um, the, people may have heard of the term ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. And uh, we know that um, those, there's, like, there's like 10 different experiences and we know those experiences make children's lives that much more difficult. So we look for that. We aren't calling them ACEs, but we look at the growing up history of the person if we have access to that. Um, we also look at how much they moved. There might have been medical problems that um, people have had. We've had several people who have had head injuries, and we know that that's um, you know, a concussion. We know that that also impacts thinking and coping abilities um, that young people have. And then we look at involvement with, um, with um, treatment, um, law enforcement, um, if they've been incarcerated at all. We're looking at all of those kinds of things um, to look at opportunities where um, prevention couldn't be implemented to save someone from walking down that same path in the future. Give us a sense of uh, who makes up the team. So the team is a combination of, well, there's probably 12 to 15 um, professionals and community members that are a part of the group. So law enforcement, um, we have someone from the judicial system, we have um, some treatment um, people who are involved in treatment. We, when we have people from a, a school setting, whether it's K-12 or post-secondary education, we have someone from that, that educational setting as well. Um, we have, have um, a pharmacist who we can consult with whenever we need to, our medical examiner, and then um, fire department staff who are often the first responders or respond when um, an overdose um, 911 call is called in within the city of La Crosse. So you, you spoke to some kinds of changes uh, that have been affected coming out of these reviews. What, what, what's an example of, of one of those tangible changes? One of the changes is um, a jail release kit that's provided to all um, people who have been discharged from the county jail. We were noticing in doing and conducting reviews that within the first couple of months after getting out of jail, if the individual returned to their former lifestyle, um, they were at a great risk of overdose. And so a jail release kit was something that was, a, was put together by some of the groups that uh, or agencies that are represented on the team. And so it includes Narcan, it in, includes um, a, a rescue mask, so for providing rescue breathing. That's one example. Um, another example is um, acknowledging that we might have a, a particularly, particularly con, um, contaminated um, supply of drugs in our community because the thought now is that there's no pure substance, even substances like meth, um, are often laced with um, fentanyl or um, xylazine in the community. 
So your most recent report describes reducing the stigma of drug addiction as an important prong. Why? I think it's important to talk about it in the community and not have people look down on folks who um, are using substances. And in order to do that, we need to talk about it openly in the community. Um, people sometimes have bad feelings about harm reduction. Well, why would you prevent people from um, overdosing? Because it's about saving their lives until they're ready to take that next step towards treatment. I also think that we need to acknowledge that many people, not all, but many people who are um, attracted to substance use are attracted because they're struggling with some other condition. Something else that has a lot of stigma in our community and probably state and, and nationwide is mental health. I also think that we need to talk about um, people who overdose in our community aren't just unsheltered people. They are people who have jobs, who have homes, might have college educations. They just are caught in that cycle, that addictive cycle of substance use. And that drive, that addiction is really, really strong. And so they might want to quit, but it's one more, one more experience with a substance and that might be the experience you know, that has the, the fentanyl in it, that then is, uh, is, leads to them having an unintentional overdose. Paula Silla, we leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks for your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. For more on this and other issues facing Wisconsin, visit our website at pbswisconsin.org and then click on the News tab. To see all of our election coverage, visit wisconsinvote.org. That's our program for tonight. I'm Frederica Freiberg. Have a good weekend. Funding for Here and Now is provided by the Focus Fund for Journalism and Friends of PBS Wisconsin.